Okay, um, just to get a brief idea, how many, how many of you were there yesterday for the scaling microconference? Okay, so you're going to find the first half of the presentation a bit repetitive, but I want to establish um, the basic preliminaries before we go on to what we have been up to. Um, so, you know what? Not everyone is Paul McKinney. Or any of these folks. Did I get your name right this time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, it's um, easy to write RCU bugs. <laughs> but you can find them. Most of us can't. In any case, uh, we reach the situation where you know all of us have a good idea of what RCU is. There are lots of papers out there and we can describe it to some extent. But I realized that you know, having a discussion with my advisor, it's hard to define it. So we sat down for some time and we came up with this definition. RCU guarantees existence of consistent data within an RCU read critical section. And once we have a definition, we can talk about correctness. What do you expect? for correct RCU behavior and uh, we came up with these set of invariants. RCU protected data is consistent. The uh, second bit is it's read only and finally garbage collection must take place. The uh, RCU protected data once it's no longer being used should be reclaimed. Now I have this word that is being used called consistent. And what does consistent really mean? So we tried defining that as well, and we came up with this. We said that it's a set of programmer-defined invariants. As long as these invariants are being met, it's consistent. Uh, people may ask, why is that important? Think about double linked list. Um, there are cases even when you're using RCU where your next dash previous might not be you. It's an inconsistent state, but since hardly anybody uh, traverses backwards, it's okay. It's consistent as far as we are concerned. So that's why we have this definition. And as I said yesterday, then I made the mistake of showing this to Paul. So this is where we were. I showed it to Paul and... <laughs> I have no idea what happened there. Okay, sorry about that. So then he comes back and says that, you know, RCU protected data is consistent. Well, that's wrong. Doesn't need to be consistent. All we say is that it's guaranteed to remain in existence. So, okay, sure, you can live with that. Um, then he tells me that this is also wrong. Instead, it's uh, read only or it has a well-defined update policy. Now, for the purpose of my work, I'm, I'm conveniently going to ignore the well-defined update policy bits because that adds a lot of complication. Um, and we are still going to go with RC protected data as read only. So once you have this, you can actually define what are RCU bugs. And they can broadly be classified as correctness bugs and performance bugs. Performance bugs, well, we will leave that to Paul. What we are interested in is, are we using RCU correctly or not? Um, so, you know, once we look at, once we have invariants, we can go ahead and actually come up with definition for bugs. And we have, you know, broadly a set of bugs, uh, stuff like we are reclaiming data too early or we never reclaim data. That might be for various reasons. Uh, we actually modify RC protected data directly. And finally, it might be inconsistent. So this is where we then come up to how can we, all of these can, you know, broadly be caught under pointer leaks. And when we reach at this position, we, we talk about how can we detect pointer leaks. What are the pre-existing, so, so we thought about you know, applying some of these pre-existing techniques. Uh, one of the popular ones is lockset. 
Uh, does anybody here know what Lockset is? Okay, so Lockset is one of these techniques that's been used to uh, detect races, and it's actually a very simple technique. Um, you know, as an example, let's say you have some protected data A, B, and C, and they are protected by three locks: lock A, lock B, lock C. And what Lockset tries to do is it, as and when you access this data, it tries to see what locks were you holding when you access this data. As long as you have a non-null non -null consistent set, it's okay. So let's say when you did lock A, lock B, access A, access B, unlock B, unlock A, the lock set for A is lock A and lock B, the lock set for B is lock A and lock B. Sometime later, you did lock A, lock C, access A, access C, unlock C, unlock A. At that point in time, the lock set for A is reduced, it's the intersection and it's just lock A. Now, if at any point in time, this intersection is null, we know we have a race somewhere. And that's how this technique works. The problem with RCU though is that you don't take locks. So, what about you know, converting RCU into locks? And this is what you know, we looked at. Let's convert RCU into locks. So it's very easy to convert reader writer locks to RCU as long as some properties are being maintained. But what about going the other way? And the biggest problem that we have is we need to be functionally equivalent. So going back to reader writer locks, you will be protected. But the behavior that you have is not the same as you would with RCU. And that is what we try, need to try and you know, achieve. So the next bit is you know, something of a thought exercise. How would we um, you know, go ahead and make this transformation? So you know, we have this set of invariants in mind, and then we try converting it to reader writer locks. What we do know is that we have multiple versions for the RC protected data. You know, when you have an update, you get a new version. And magically some, somehow you are able to create an RW lock every time you create a new version. This, okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, we always know the moment you do an RCU read lock, you have entered an RCU read critical section. So we need to let the system know that we are in an RCU read critical section. So one other change needed there. RCU dereference is where we start having you know, where we are actually using these private reader writer locks that we talked about. So, since you know what version you are about to dereference, uh, it, before you do that, you go ahead and grab that lock that's you know, part of that version. So, you have now been able to create a lock set for it. And at RC read unlock, that's where you drop the locks uh, and you end the critical section. So, so now you actually have. Uh, the ability to convert RCU into reader writer lock. Um, there is one bit missing here, and that's at cleanup time. That's the only point in time where you actually uh, try to grab this reader writer lock in the write mode. And the, the neat thing about this approach is you should never ever block, because if you block at cleanup stage, you have you know, tried to reclaim too soon. That shouldn't be happening. Now, Paul has a few objections there, <laughs> and I will let him, you know, talk about that in a moment. But, uh, you know, uh, continuing on with this, the problem was that it's a pretty complicated conversion, needed a lot of final changes, trying to understand, and this magical instantiation of an RW lock is not really as straightforward as we think it is. And the other thing is that it, uh, you know, failed the Paul McKinney test. He kept coming up with too many corner cases, and we had to have special cases to do this, special cases to do that, uh, which you know made us think on what else could we do. Now, the same conference last year, I had been trying to figure out if it's possible to have something of a watch point range, and you know that's the question: What if I could watch all the RCU protected data? And sometime earlier this year, we came up with this. Thought. Now, I need to say this at first. <laughs> I apologize for you know, not caring about other architectures. Um, but you know what? 
everybody in the world uses XH664, so I'm just going to worry about that. <laughs> um, so the nice thing, maybe depends on how you see it, is that XH664 only uses 48 bits for its, for its addresses. The upper 16 bits are always one, and anytime you change that, you have a general protection fault. This is what we you know, try to exploit. What if I am actually expecting a general protection fault to take place? What, so do something, encode something in these top 16 bits and inside the general protection fault handler actually fix it up because I'm expecting it. So this is what we're trying to do. Um, what we do is we poison all the RCU protected pointers uh, when we do an RCU assigned pointer. So at the end of RCU assigned pointer, you actually have a poison pointer coming in. You never ever have an unpoisoned pointer. Um, why, if you may ask, it's sort of hard to figure out when you should be poisoning the pointer and at what point in time. What if the pointer has been propagated somewhere else? How do you fix it up? Uh, so the next thing is that you know, when we do an RCU dereference, you get yet another pointer which has some data added to it within these top 16 bits letting us know are we in the correct critical section or, or has it been in access somewhere else. It's, it's quite possible that you could get an RC protected pointer in one read critical section and you try using it in another critical section. There's, there are no guarantees at that point in time. So, so we need to catch that and so on. So we do that. Uh, you know, and Obviously, at some point in time, we're going to have a general protection fault. And that's where we go ahead and check, are we doing things correctly? If you're not doing things correctly, um, you know, we go ahead and complain loudly about it. Otherwise, um, you know, things are fine, and we continue on as it was. It slows things down, yes, but it's a debugging aid. So I don't really care too much about the performance. Where are we right now? I have a basic trace points ready. Um, Paul and I seem to have come to a con some sort of a consensus on an algorithm that detects pointer leaks. Um, right now, I am working on getting some of the emulation bits done up. It's hard. I'm trying to use the KVM framework in this. And now, please start the discussion. <laughs> So I really would like some more details about exactly what you're doing with poisoning pointers. There is a reason why those pointers are, are invalid, and that is because if you, I can guarantee you that we will not be using 48-bit pointers for all future. This is the lesson that uh, you know, uh, Apple and others learned back in the M68Ks days, and the, re the reason you know, those bits are ignored, or those bits trap rather than being ignored is because, well, they were being abused. So, um, um, using them for poisoning pointers would have to be something you want to be extremely careful about at the very best and keep, and keeping in mind that this, this may not last forever. There are other options, but, uh, in, 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 particu in particular, um, uh, if, if on SMAP enabled hardware, you can simply use a user space pointer. Okay. With the, where the top, with, with the top bit clear, because it will trap, as because the you know in with SMAP on, except in very carefully controlled piece of the kernel, uh, kernel space not allowed to touch user space. So um, now that may be, there may be justifications uh, why, okay, well, may, maybe poison pointers is, is an important enough use case that uh, we, want, we want to consider that going forward, but that is something that needs to be discussed with uh, the, you know, with, with, uh, uh, with top level architects. and. Uh, and uh, probably will take a long time before we can give any kind of architectural guarantee along those lines. 
So I'm quite aware that the I'm not expecting to get any guarantees from Intel or and the fact that those 16 bits are never going to be used. I, I kind of expect that they will get used for something in the future. Are you using the bits or are you just putting a crap value there? Uh, we are actually using the bits, but uh, what are you using them for? Well, at this point in time, we are having some generational information in that. Um, Essentially, uh, when was this pointer actually accessed, uh, or rather dereferenced, um, and, and such. But, you know, it doesn't matter if Intel starts using these bits in the future, and that point in time, yes, sure, it's not useful. But right now, it can actually catch bugs. Okay. So what to, to expand on Dolph's answer a little bit, what happens is every outermost RC read lock, what he does is he increments a counter. And so you have an idea that for each thread, there's kind of a, a number for an RC read side critical section. And then when you do the RC dereference, uh, among other things, I mean, he does, it's a little more complicated, but to simplify a little bit and probably to be a little bit inaccurate, but so it goes, um, you take the current uh, read side critical section number and stuff it in the upper bits of the pointer. And then any time you access a pointer that faults, it's going to fault because the upper bits aren't the right value. You check to see if the current read side critical section number matches the pointer's upper bits. If it doesn't, you scream, you've got a pointer leak. If it does match, you fix it up and let it go. So, um, yeah, it's a hack and yeah, it'll die at some point. To a, uh, uh, I well remember the uh, old things back when only 24 bits of the 3D bit address space were used. Uh, but uh, if you got other ways to do it, that'd be really cool. Oh, you're recording it. So you could um, you could add another level of interaction where you um, basically. Similar to, like, you basically spawn a few struct pages um, that get a special type so that when you access them, um, they would basically tell you, I'm, I'm a special uh, RCU type field. And then every time you, you would bump up your pointer, you create a new page for that. Well, you, 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 you have this tag in your, in your pointer, right? The, the RCU region tag. And every time you would bump this one up, you basically simply create a new page. And the ID, the, the um, offset in the page tells you which, um, which variable you're accessing. And then you have a table per page that you can basically use to look, look everything out. So essentially you want shadow page tables. Hmm? Essentially you want shadow page it's tables. It's not shadow page tables. It's basically um, take all the information that you have in, um, in your pointer right now. And instead of keeping it in that pointer, create a completely new pointer that um, you just use um, normal Linux data structures to look up what you actually want to have as information that you currently take from the pointer. You get two benefits on that, right? You basically, you do not ever spawn a general protection fault. You go through the normal page fault path, um, which means it works cross architecture. Plus, it actually works, um, works in the future too. You can just, you know, even if there's 60 of address space, it will still work because this, this, um, you can extend your address space as much as you like, right? You need a garbage collector then because it has lifetime issues. Well, once you stop using an, a section, you can kill that page, right? Yeah, how do you come to no, know when to no, kill? No, no, that's why it pointer. No, it doesn't matter because you have a well-known point. You have RC assigned pointer. Uh, that's the point when you can actually do all these changes. Well, the, the case... Okay, so the case where everything completely blows up, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you just have this, this very sparse, um, this very sparse virtual address range um, with lots of pages, say you have like a million pages that you could use there, and you're only using like a um, hundred a second at most, then um, by simply removing your mapping, you know that there's no mapping there at all, so you can scream, and that's all you need to, knew, to do, right? Right, so Paul had a similar idea. Paul? Do you mind actually the stuff we were talking about half an hour ago? Uh, I, I was proposing to Deval you could uh, 
use a modified page table entry where you smash, you could have a per CPU page, you could, you could have a per CPU uh, CR3. I'm talking the x86 case, obviously, but you could do the same thing on other architectures, where when you did the RCUD reference, you installed it, and the address you would put in, you'd reserve some range uh, and that was actually valid on that modified CR3. And you'd swap it back out when you do um, RCU unlock or a context switch, and as long as you're in, not in preempt RCU, in which case you'd only do it on RCU unlock. And in those, the garbage address would actually be a valid address, and you wouldn't have to res uh, rely on reserved bits, and you wouldn't have to take the GPF uh, on dereferencing it. Um, the, there are some obviously finicky things you'd have to be careful of. Um, it does have some nice properties, like you don't have to worry about the fact that you're know, losing like TLB invalidation or anything, because when you swap it back out, you're going to do a full swap and flush everything anyway. Um, mm, the other thing. No, I think you just want to. What you, what I would, how I would propose you would do it, is you would just grab a chunk of address. Like, so you, because the kernel level addresses are all shared, you would want to take a very large swath of the kernel level addresses. So you could take one of the top level entries, and say these are all are going to be our poisoned RCU addresses. And then when you took a, when you did RCU assign pointer, you would assign it an address in that range, and you would set up a duplicate PTE that maps to the same place as where you're doing RCU assign pointer to. And that PTE would only be valid in your, in your special CR3, which you'd only install when you did. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is not a new idea, by any means. It's just, it's, it seemed. Yeah, sure, maybe you can, I mean, ASAN does some things sort of like this, right? Um, but, but it seemed easier than trying to handle, because with, with the GPF approach, you have to decode and emulate the read and write um, for it to proceed. If you do this, right, right, no, I, I'm just saying, if, if you do this or some other approach that you don't have to do emulation, not doing x86 emulation is a really nice thing. <laughs> Uh, two questions. Uh, first, what about bugs involving incorrect usage of RCU pointer or RCU dereference pointer or incorrect failure to use them? Right. Um, so it relies on a couple of things that at some point in time you have used RCU, uh, one of the RCU very uh, functions correctly. Um, so if you have done an RCU assign pointer at some point in time, you should have a poison pointer. If you have done an RCU dereference at some point in time, you should have another poison pointer. If you're not getting any of these, you know something's gone wrong somewhere. You don't know where, but you at least know there's something wrong. And you go ahead and complain about that. Yeah, that might be a good thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, secondly, have you actually detected any bugs so far? Um, Either with this scheme or another one. Right. Um, so we have, we have another tool that does something similar, and it's very, very heavyweight. And that has um, detected some of the uh, synthetic bugs that we brought up. Um, so it does detect bugs. Um, however, this bit is still under development because, as I said, as, as Paul also mentioned, x86 emulation is painful. I, I, there's some, actually something I should have mentioned before. Um, something I've been tangentially involved in, the people behind TSAN have been doing it, that had, there's something new called kernel address sanitizer, which does binary recompilation to do this address translation and validation. Um, I, I don't know if people have been watching the list, but that's actually already recorded about 10 bugs uh, and is working. You could probably adapt the scheme that that uses um, much more simply, and that also catches use after free and everything else. Right. So. Andy told me about that earlier on this week, and so I'm just going to take a look at it.
just on the um, PTE direct modification thing that you were talking about, just a small comment on that, that I just remembered. Um, one reason this doesn't, or one, one badness about it is that it, it basically limits you to use cases that on, on machines that actually have page tables. Once you use something else like a software loaded TLB or an HTAP or something else that is not a page table, um, it, it, you, know, you, don't, you simply lose your information of whether that page ever got mapped or not, so you need to keep that somewhere else, which again would be a struct page. So, I mean, at you this could basically combine those two approaches. Uh, at this point in time, I kind of want to ask this question. Is, does it matter which architecture detects the bug? I mean, it would be nice to run it on all architectures, but as it's long a, as... It's a really big issue for me because my ICU box happen in a PowerPC only code. <laughs> so I, I do have to have this run on PowerPC only. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure Paul will have enough um, incentive to get it working on PowerPC. <laughs> I suppose we could just emulate it, but that might uh, defeat the purpose. Oh, one, one thing that one could imagine, you could imagine doing is if you have 64 address, rather than relying on the machine to do it, if, if that, you know, ignoring the other approaches, which might be better, all right, but if those don't work out for some reason, you could just, you, you could convince the machine to invalidate the upper bits of the address just by providing mappings saying mm -hmm. it wasn't there. Yeah, uh, I or, think it's very similar to what everybody else has been suggesting. I mean. Reserve okay. a bit of, Although reserve you, some pages yeah. aside. No, I'm going to reserve the whole chunk of the, the chunk of the address space that would be reserved. If you, and that, you could do that in power and then use his scheme if worse comes to worse. But if one of his other schemes works, then you could do that instead. Okay. Maybe. And, and the other thing that I thought is, and all of these approaches kind of do cover it, is that the use cases that we have um, extend a lot beyond RCU. And RCU is the one that I have picked up because that's my research topic. But anybody you ask and you say, hey, by the way, I'm going to give you unlimited watch points. They, they like the idea of unlimited watch points. So. <laughs> I mean, it's a poison pointer, but you're, you're actually watching data. I, I think the term that they used, uh, use in our group is behavioral watch points. Because depending on what behavior you want to watch, you can set it up. OK? OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'll actually ask Paul and Andrew to continue the talk from yesterday, if they wish to. Yeah, which is why it would be nice if you, now that you have a lot of time to talk about it. <laughs>